Okay, let's roll. Ralph yeah. Ashton, welcome. We're live, my friend. Yeah, thank you for having me. I want to start with talking about Australian Futures Project, the genesis of it, what you're doing, how you're doing it, and why you're doing it. So can can we just jump straight into that? Yeah, I started the Australian Futures Project seven or eight years ago now because I was just sort of curious and frustrated at the same time about why the richest country in the world, Australia, pretty much when you look at it per capita, um, was struggling so much with some fairly fundamental problems that a lot of people agreed were the things that we needed to uh, address as a country if we wanted to keep being a great country, which we are, mm. whether it's things like climate change or obesity, diabetes, being able to engage with Asia where the markets of the future are for Australia, yep. um, the equality of women, Indigenous opportunity, infrastructure, tax reform to take account of a changing economy. So all different types of issues that the experts um had been pointing to for a decade that needed action. Yeah. And our system of making those big decisions just seemed stuck. So I wanted to create something that would look at why. Why is Australia stuck? Mm. And then and then start building some solutions. Yeah. So rather than diving straight into solutions, look at what what's the underlying cause. Because your background lawyer, investment banker, and then it seemed to morph into not-for-profit and more humanitarian things. Was there something in your life that made you move away from pure capitalism and and in wanting to do something for, for the better good or was it more you weren't being satisfied from being an investment banker? Um. I was being satisfied. I, I loved being a lawyer. I loved being an investment banker. I mean, investment banking in some ways was ideal for me. It brought together maths, which I love, Yeah. brought together strategy, negotiating, finding a deal, doing the deal, uh, yeah. presenting data and information in a, you know, in a, in a, good way graphically. Mm. So I had all these different elements and, but the thing that I found missing, I had this sort of artistic passion around photography and other things and those jobs are so all-consuming. I didn't have time to get into my photography. So I quit banking to go and do photography, which led to, to those other things that you just talked about. Yeah, and the link from photography to those things was that the fact that you were out there and for the first time really appreciating that we had some challenges or... You just had more bandwidth to to actually contemplate because again, it seems like a bit of a a bridge going from photography into wanting to resolve some, I dare say, monumental problems. Yeah, I look. I I grew up overseas. I grew up in Papua New Guinea. I have always had a, a an interest in well, not always, but from not like when I was a little kid, but. For a long time, I've had an interest in the big issues, in politics, in how society makes decisions. Mm. Um, I'm I'm interested in, you know, or I get frustrated where there's a there's an opportunity to to make a good decision, um, and that decision's not made. So from photography, I I was always interested in nature, the outdoors. Uh, I worked with World Wildlife Fund in Australia to put together a book on the Tarkine in the northwest of Tasmania. It was at that stage the second largest unprotected temperate rainforest in the world. Wow. So I pulled together uh, the best photographers in Tasmania, the best writers, took them into this forest, which was largely undocumented, and then with that, with Alan and Unwin, created a book for WWF, and that then got me into working with... World Wildlife Fund, and I'll con- if you want me to continue, I'll continue that story. Please. You know? and so I and I, I started working with WWF where I was working on policy issues and bringing my legal and banking skills into that role. Can I understand with WWF, is it a government or is it a, a, a pure NGO? No, it's a pure NGO. Yeah. So it's an international NGO. NGO. It's okay, got- great. Yeah, it's got an arm here in Australia. So 
worked on issues related to the environment in Tasmania. Um, and this is, I'm digressing a bit, but it, I think it's interesting from the perspective of this is my approach is there's a lot of focus on, you know, chopping down tall trees. Yeah. And that's an important issue. But when you look at, at the whole environmental context, some of the sort of shorter trees or the grasses and grasslands were more important from a biodiversity point of view f- from where all the, you know, the, the, the range of animals and plants and insects live. Yeah. So we put together a package which was the whole package. So mm. how do we protect important cultural values around tall trees and they've got environmental values as well yeah. plus look after uh, the grasslands that are really important but are neglected plus look after some pretty ugly shrubland that no one pays much attention to. But, but it's, it's critically important. But it's critically important. Yeah. And think about a transition for the economy that was reliant on you know forestry. doing things on yeah. forestry right mm. and farming and put together something that was you know could work from all those different perspectives. So we we, we worked on that then in uh, the the tsunami happened in um, 2004 2004 boxing yeah. day um wwf is in a sense a franchise they have lots of different organizations around the world under an umbrella mm. suddenly all of them were wanting to help for good reason plus you had the red cross world vision the world bank the united nations organizations all the governments around the world wanting to come and help in Banda Aceh, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka, in India, and in the Maldives. Mm. And so all this sort of uncoordinated effort with great intent was, you know, going to potentially stymie things. So I set up with a colleague in the United States a coordinated response to the tsunami for WWF, which was then about, okay, of course, we need to look after people immediately, right? That's that's going to be people's first reaction, and that's that's um, totally correct and justifiable. But if you look after people's needs in a way that doesn't think about the medium to long term impacts, mm. you're going to do things that fix things immediately, but cause medium to long term problems. Yeah. So an example of that is lots of people, thousands of people, lost their homes. If you just go in, you'd think, well, the simplest place to rebuild homes is where it's flat. Yeah. The problem is where it's flat is usually where the water comes. a floodplain. Yeah. Next thing you think is, well, uh, the easiest place to go and grab the timber is just up that hill, up that valley. Mm-hmm. We'll just chop down that forest, get the timber and build houses on this floodplain, which we didn't know it was a floodplain. Mm. Then what are you doing? You're destroying the habitat, but you're also increasing the the risk of flooding yeah. because those trees are gone. So, you know, and another example would be, so the major economy in those places was fishing. So great, let's go and give everyone, all the fishermen, and it was largely men fishing, um, new boats, new nets, new motors. Mm. But if you do that without thinking about, well, are those boats and motors and nets better than what they had before, which means they can go and get more fish out of the sea. Yeah. And if you don't, and if you've lost a whole lot of, um, sadly, a whole lot of um, knowledge because people have died about fish stocks, about where the breeding grounds are, about how to protect the whole system, yeah. you're just going to go, yep, great, bump a year. Yeah. Whoops, nothing for the next 10 years. A bit like factory farming. Yeah, and they went through extreme stuff too, didn't they, where they actually started bombing to to catch fish that they thought, oh, wow, that's the quickest way to kill all the fish and not realising that they're, they're, they're virtually killing the, the golden goose by doing that. Yeah, and I don't know if that was – I didn't come across that in the tsunami, but you hear stories yeah. of that sort of approach Throughout to – Indonesia. Yeah. Yep. Interesting you spoke about with the WWF in – Tasmania around the focus on the trees because I think a lot of a lot of what we face in the meat industry you know when you look at the the vegetarian and vegan movement in particular and whether they're driven by environmental or health or animal welfare reasons that they get very emotive around protecting the 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 
precious and the pretty looking stuff. So the big animals, they want to protect the lambs, they want to protect the cows, they want to do that. But they don't truly, in my view, they don't truly understand, to your point, that sometimes it's not chopping down the big trees that is the problem, it's the problem that we're chopping down the grasslands and the shrubs, which kind of aren't as pretty and aren't as dramatic as chopping down the trees and it's it certainly doesn't look as good on Instagram and it's not as good as dinner party conversation and all those things and it's it seems very analogous to, to what we're going through at the moment, which, you know, we never say it's right or wrong, but what we are trying to get people to understand is that you can't just have this blinkered approach to saying one thing's good and one thing's bad because it's such a complex problem and that by feeding the world just on plants and having to grow all those plants, you're probably doing more damage, albeit to way smaller animals that we don't necessarily see and aren't as cute and don't sit on the on the Australian flag and all those kinds of things, but they're critically important to the economic, sorry, to the ecological health of, of this planet that we live on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I you can you can look at insects and kind of this conversation that's bubbling away on, you know, we should eat more insects, but actually we've got a real problem at the moment around the world with decline of insects. And if we don't have insects, then ecosystems really struggle. Mm. So I think there are a couple of things I'd pick up in, in what you've just said. One is everything we do involves a judgment. And, and it's only right or wrong because we've decided to call it right or wrong. Mm. Because it, it, it – so – it should be right if it's taking us to the place we want to get to and wrong if it's taking us away from that place. I think a, a lot of times we and you know people in the conversation, whether it's about meat, whether it's about other issues, kind of get so caught up in the here and now of the whatever's emotive or whatever's currently being talked about that they lose sight of well, where are we trying to get to? Mm. And therefore if we're trying to get to that place, what do we need to do now, tomorrow, the next month, the next year, the next decade to get there? Yeah, the next generation. Even. Yeah. Yeah, if we want to get really serious about this. Yeah. And what trade-offs do we therefore need to make? Yeah. And what sort of bullshit do we actually need to call out where people are asking us or claiming that, that, that we can't have the cake and eat it? Yeah. So sometimes... Does something come to mind when you say that? Like is there something that you hear repeatedly that you need to call out or you want to call out bullshit on, particularly when it comes to environmental? I think the classic one at the moment is uh, energy prices and climate change. Mm -hmm. Like it's just so short-sighted and even so disconnected from reality and the facts and the trends to sort of suggest that we can't have lower energy prices and address climate change. Yeah. So some in politics and the media and business and in lobby groups uh, is sort of putting them up against each other as you have to have one or the other. As I will, the missing bit there in this case is actually fact but often the missing bit there is imagination mm. it's like okay what if we wanted both those things mm. like how would we make that happen so when we're thinking about meat what if what if we wanted to still eat meat and really good quality nutritious meat yeah and look after the environment like can't we start from the premise of how do we make that happen yep. rather than we have to choose one or the other yeah and it's a really good point because, I, I, again, I, and, and this comes from within the industry too, is that factory farming in particular and intensive farming in general, people say, well, we've got 7 billion people to feed, that we're going to have 9.7 billion in 2050 according to the forecast and to feed that amount of people based on the per capita consumption of meat, we're going to, we actually need to find another half a planet to do that which you go, well, that's probably not going to happen unless Elon Musk really ups his game and he's probably the only one that I've seen on the planet that's really looking that hard. But actually, is that true? If we 
go back to to more basic and natural principles. And there are there are farmers out there, there are farmers that supply us out there that are proving beyond reasonable doubt that basic natural polyculture rotational farming systems can yield more than the the most capital intensive factory farms but it's breaking that short termness that that you know your your whole project focuses on that people go well that's all well and good but I've got banking covenants and if I don't if I breach them this year then they're going to take my farm mm. so I'm sorry, my friend, but this generation, I can't help it for you. And and it just becomes this vicious cycle, you know, and I think, you know, again, it's, it's, it's something that I've gleaned from reading about what you're doing is that it really is a complex problem. Most of these problems are super complex and, and they've become multi-generational problems and you have organizations like Monsanto that – you know, whether it's here or in third world countries where they provide the seeds, they provide the the fertilizers, they provide the insecticides and herbicides, and they provide quite often the, the debt funding. And it's just this vicious cycle of if people don't continue year in year out to increase yields, then they're going to be bankrupted and, and they literally will take the keys to the farm. Yeah, I think that also brings up, so A, uh, vested interest who uh, you know, they have a lot of power and they want the system to say as it is. They want the status quo because that's why they're the vested interest. That's why they've got so much power. And they want to keep that. So any any change needs to be really clever about you know addressing that vested interest. And the other thing you brought up, which is – you talked about it in, in terms of, say, um, changing farming practices, but it, it goes across a lot of important issues, whether it's climate change or reducing um, the the amount of money that we spend as a society on chronic illnesses that are preventable. Yeah. Obesity, diabetes. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, yeah. um, mental health even. And yeah. I'm not saying all of them are preventable, but they're chronic Most. illnesses, right? Yeah. So this idea of a transition. So again, people, I think they want, they want, or they try and confuse the conversation by saying there's A or there's B. Mm. We're here or we're there, and we can't go from here to there because it's too big a jump, mm. or for these other reasons. Yeah. You know, well, no, this might be a 15-year or a 20-year transition that we have to go through mm. or, you know, to change from high-yielding, low-nutrition agriculture globally yep. to maybe equal yielding or a little bit yes, less yielding or a little bit more yielding high-quality nutrition yep. food, right? Yeah. Um, changing the economy to decarbonize it to deal with climate change, that doesn't happen overnight, but that doesn't mean you don't do it. Mm. Yep, I agree. And and again, just on that theme of getting people to change their view on, I can't afford good quality food. And you hear it all the time. Well, it's all well and good, but I can't afford to eat that. And I go, well, perhaps that's true. But if you take a, a longer term view and start talking about chronic disease is that the cost of looking after yourself now, which a significant portion of that is actually eating better quality food and eating way less of it, which is, you know, there's there's benefits in, in that for, for you and for the planet, is going to pay a dividend 10x, 100x, 1000x, perhaps way more than that in terms of what it's going to cost you to actually look after yourself if you get diabetes if you get some kind of cognitive disease, you know, like Alzheimer's is two hundred and fifty dollars to $350,000 for the last five years of a person's life. You know, like that's a lot of good quality nutritional food that you could have enjoyed in the early stages of your life. And lo and behold, perhaps it would have mitigated the risk of getting that disease and you could have enjoyed the, the later years of your life. But I think most people have that view of, you know what, yeah, you may be right, but it's not going to happen to me. Or if it does, then the government and our health system, which is great in Australia, will look after me. Yeah, and so again, there's the, that, that idea of... 
um, as you say, who's going to bear the cost of the two different things? So the food, I'm bearing the cost. Yeah. Dealing with my disease later, the state or the government is dealing with that cost. But that's so the change, isn't yeah, it? So like why don't we get the government now to actually – Put in place incentives the, that people that are applying sustainable agricultural practices actually get rewarded, as opposed to what seems to be the case that the the beasts of the the world, the grain corps and the the Monsantos and the big pharmaceutical companies that tend to have their claws and tentacles all over the agricultural companies to seem to get all the tax breaks and and um, all sorts of other benefits from from the government. So yeah, yeah that's the and that's a, the systemic change that needs to happen. And by which I mean that the whole system has to change. And if you've got very powerful players in that system, then it's hard to move to to make that change happen. And I think what then happens is people get annoyed. And they feel powerless because they're not the powerful people in that system, but they can see they're either being ripped off or they're not having the choices that they want to have around food at a price that they can afford, even if they are well-educated about food. Um, So they're feeling powerless and then they get angry. Mm. And then their response to the system is a lot of heat in a way. It's a lot of like anger and energy going into the, sort of the here and now and things that are really important, but they're not being done in a way that is going to shift the system. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You talk on your website and, and in the various things I've, I've listened and, and read about you and, and the project about creating the future. And if we're going to create the future, because it's coming anyway, then let's be deliberate about that. Is there a platform or a playbook or, or, or whatever you want to call it that, that you, you use as an organisation but that you recommend to whether it's government bodies or others to, to actually apply in, in putting together deliberate plans around some of these big challenges? I think the first thing is to, the first thing is to work out what you want, right? So... Um, Do you, and let's take food again, Um, there's there's a lot of talk about this sort of unstoppable momentum towards a bigger population globally. Yeah. Well, that's one variable in an equation which tells you, you know, what the options are. So, yes, okay, we choose and we are choosing as a society globally, we're choosing to have more and more people. Mm -hmm. So we've made a choice about that. That's yeah. been, but let's be deliberate about that yeah. and then know what the consequences are. Or maybe we should start questioning that also. Yeah. yeah. So the consequences are that in a, uh, in a limited environment that there's going to be some limit around what that environment can produce in terms of volume and quality of food. Yeah. And, of course, technology can come into that and I will probably talk about technology and, and food in a little while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's like what there's a little trade-off going on there, which is actually quite a big trade-off of if you have more people then and you want to have good health outcomes and you don't want to destroy the environment so that we can still have a good life for the good for the people that are being born, mm. then you either have to choose to have fewer people or put a whole lot more effort into technology or into education or into other things to make sure that what's being produced and eaten and thrown away. Yeah is within the boundaries of the environment. Yeah. Yeah, and I I think back to what you were saying before and I'm certainly guilty of this is that they do seem to be mutually exclusive. We want more people. We've got um, limited resources. We want to have a, a planet that continues to prosper and grow and is here for our children and our grandchildren and generations to come, but... There doesn't seem to be any interplay between wanting those three things and, you know, your your phrase before about having your cake and eating it too, that I think we need to get way smarter around how we approach these things. 
you know, and, and, and it could be as simple as unwinding this bizarre paradox that we have as a society where we've got 70 to 75% of the world walking around obese and malnourished at the same time. Yeah. Like only a human could create that ecosystem like that we just continue to produce high caloric food that is nutritionally devoid. You know, and it's one of the things that we talk about as a business all the time is that we actually want people to eat less meat. Mm. We want people to eat less full stop, you know, but we want people to eat more nutritionally dense food that has so many flow on effects for them as a person, for the planet as a whole and for animal welfare also. And I think also for business, right? Like just just this concept of sort of bulk versus value, and I'm not talking about really high end stuff, but mm. everywhere, everywhere, yeah. And if 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 you can create, if you can produce something that is higher quality, mm. that requires people to have less of it to get the same benefit or or even a better benefit, yeah, then you can still capture the same amount of economic. Yeah, benefit more out of quite that often. or more, right? Yeah. So I know I would prefer to eat, um, you know, uh, less of a really tasty bit of meat mm. than a big hunk of meat that doesn't taste like anything. Yeah, right? exactly. And then I think about the nutrition in that as well and, mm. um, yeah. And it is that change and I, I've spoken about this before on the show that I think Patagonia as a business is a a really beautiful case study around actually putting values first, that they want people to question everything before they buy something else. Can you repair it? Do you really need it at this point in time? And their business model has prospered for, for decades and decades. And they did that beautiful documentary that had both Yvonne Chouinard and uh, I always forget his name, who was the founder of North Face, where mm. they've created this amazing um, wildlife reserve in, um, in Chile. You know, to protect the, the 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 climate at the end of the day, but but certainly the rainforests and the, and the national parks in that country that were being destroyed. But that whole principle, I mean, the and the uh, documentary was called "180 Degrees South" around this just bizarre human philosophy of if we're not progressing forward, then we're we're actually going backwards. Whereas quite often, and I think there's never been a period in the history of man. Than, than right now where we actually do need to turn around and rethink about how we're doing things and march back the other way. And farming and agriculture, I think, is is one industry where we actually need to do that. And and the, the progress, which is defined in my eyes by factory farming and intensive farming, we need to really question and, and quickly unwind that before it, it does career out of control. Yeah, look, I think a lot of things that that were good that worked in the you know the the twentieth century, and this is not my point, but you know things like factory farming, uh, coal as an energy source, all sorts of different things that were were great in the twentieth century, mm. are just not going to be good in the twenty first century. And so again, I come back to let's be deliberate about creating the future we want. Let's not sleepwalk into a future based on extrapolating stuff from 100 years ago that we've just been, frankly, lazy about not recalibrating. Mm. So what do we want for the future? Do, do, we, do we just want to make lots of money? Do we want just lots of people to keep a Ponzi scheme of an economy going so they just keep buying more and more and more stuff? Or Is that how you think of Australia and the free world? To a degree, I think that there's an element of econ economic growth that is that is driven. Well, there is economic. An element of economic growth is driven by population growth, right? Yep. So and consumption and consumption, which yep. comes from you know, population growth. Population and, growth. Yeah. So there's. Um, I'm not down on capitalism or on economic growth per se, uh, but that sh that's not the end goal for me being on the planet. Like. Mm. Sure, it enables lots of things, but why do we even want to be here? Why do we want to bring kids onto the planet? Um, let's think about that. Let's yeah. have that conversation. Uh, my sense is that, and I've got data on this from the work at the Australian Futures Project, that 
people, so everyday Australians care about certain things and they think, well, they don't see those things reflected in what powerful people are talking about. When we say powerful people, we're talking about the rich and the talking about politicians, politicians, yeah, um, big business people, leaders of community organisations, the media, yeah, those sorts of people. Got it. Right. So, what's sort of referred to as the national conversation? Yeah. What what they're talking about. Um. So, where was I going with that? That you've got the data on. What does the yeah. data say that the average Australian wants then? Well, I'll just finish that point, which is that um, the the they because they don't see what they care about reflected in what powerful people in the media are talking about. They yeah. almost feel a little bit shy or embarrassed to talk about the stuff they care about. Mm. So, how are we going to have a deliberate conversation about what we want to become as a society, and therefore what choices we need to make mm. if we're not even talking about the real stuff? Yeah. yeah. So. Research we did three years ago showed that you know, people really valued honesty and fun and you know some and looking after disadvantaged people, looking after older people, mm. um, thinking about future generations. Not a lot of that sort of stuff is talked about in the media. Um, we've just done some work with our the Perfect Candidate Initiative and. The top five things that people want in Australia or are most concerned about right now is cost of living. <laughs> we'll probably come back to that given, you know, yeah. food is a big part of people's weekly bills. Yeah. Um, better healthcare and hospitals. Yeah. And our healthcare system is pretty good by world standards. But yes. Yeah. Um, open and honest government mm. comes in at their third biggest concern. Yeah. Climate change fourth, and managing the economy fifth. So I think up and up until a couple of months ago, people wouldn't have thought the everyday person wouldn't have thought, for instance, that open and honest government and climate change were in the top five, five concerns yeah. of Australians across the whole country. Yeah, and you probably would have guessed cost of living, managing the economy, healthcare. Yeah, but those two. Yeah. So once that's out in the open, to your question about the playbook. I think a lot of the playbook and dealing with vested interest in the national conversation is get the data, make that transparent so everyone can see it, then have a, a genuinely curious and honest conversation about what do we want. Mm. Don't try and infect it with one's own views. Views, yeah. Because there are very, very binary views. Like climate change is a classic. Like I sat at a a lunch with my brother and a bunch of ex-finance mates of mine at, at Christmas time that are all unbelievably successful, all incredibly well-educated, all nature lovers to a degree. They, you know, they all ski, they all surf, they all live in beautiful locations in Sydney typically. And it was literally a divide between half, the, there was eight of us. Four of us were absolutely... I would say well-read and open-minded that we really did have a, a big issue with climate change. The other four were of the view that it's all conflicted research, that the people that do the research, that having a an outcome that says there's climate change is the thing that's going to drive them getting more funding and so we don't have to worry about it. And so having two Range Rovers in my garage and driving them to Macquarie Bank every day is not my concern it's 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 all just propaganda you know it's it's almost like the the trumpian approach to to climate change how do you guys you know and, and i get the empathy and the understanding and and not being on either side of the ledger but but what's your approach to to i suppose getting people and both sides to be open-minded, but particularly those people that don't see the problem despite the hard data that we seem to have on climate change. Yeah, and this goes beyond climate change too. This goes to lots of lots of the big issues where there are winners and losers, where there are perceived winners and losers, so people have got things at stake as well. Uh, yeah, my approach has always really been to bring the data together dispassionately and the evidence but that's not enough because of the things you've just you've just talked about 
So it's then finding ways for the people that can have an influence um, to have a conversation and talk through those things but talk through them uh, kind of away from, I guess, reduce the stakes, right, so that learning can happen on both sides. Because if you're in social media and it does this sort of crazy aggressive place – you're either um, right or you're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And and so it's very hard to do any learning in that setting because you, there's just too much at stake and you're going to get shouted down. So um you know take people away from that setting, take people away from their day-to-day work setting. Mm. Give them an opportunity to sit with other people with data, with information where the stakes are lower and start getting different understandings because none of us can have a complete understanding. There's this beautiful saying of, you know, if if the map was accurate, the map has to be as big as the area that it's a map of. Yeah, yeah. Right? It makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So a map, and if we use a map as a metaphor for sort of any summarised understanding of things, mm. has to be incomplete. Yeah, and no one of us can have a complete understanding. So everyone's got different angles in on what this problem is, what the solution is, and when we bring when when we can bring many angles together, many perspectives, mm. surprising things can happen creatively. Yeah. Okay. So you have people who care about animals. You have people who care about water quality, have people who care about the Great Barrier Reef, you have people who care about climate change, about nutrition, about uh, disadvantaged Australians having access to quality food, yeah. libertarians who care about, well, just everyone has their own free choice, get on with it. Bring all of them together and have a conversation around even understanding what the problem is to start with and yeah. then starting to tease about some solutions. How do you prioritize some of that stuff? Because it's such a an interesting perspective or or idea that you raise, and I can imagine having a room full of all those people that you spoke about with all their, some of them conflicting, some of them very aligned concerns and 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 cares. How would you go about facilitating a group like that to come up with? Uh, a plan, you know, a deliberate plan around what are the big priorities? Like, one, what would the process be? And and two, do you have a sense of where we really should be prioritizing our time? Like, is there something that's coming so fast that if we don't do something about it, then nothing else is really going to matter because we really are going to be in, in dire straits as a, as a species? Well, to the first question, there are various processes that work really well, so social processes of facilitating people um, with information to get to good results. So there's work that Otto Sharma has done in the United States around something called Theory U, um, which is a process. I've used that, Australian Futures Project has used that in the past a lot. Other organisations use versions of it. There's design thinking that can be used as well, which has been used in engineering for many, many years and is now getting much more into public policy. So there are processes that work well. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. Okay. In terms of the – and, you know, really interesting thing things happen when you let go of control. So you have a group of 30 or 60 people from all different walks of life or all parts of the system – who you might think hate each other, who have a completely diametrically opposed view on things and give them two days in one of these processes and some of the solutions that come out and some of the consensus that comes out mm-hmm. is extraordinary. What's the big thing that that, that society has to keep focused on that, that's coming? It, it's climate change. Um, it's climate change. It's extinctions. I think it's um, in a globalised world... Uh, it's global inequality is going to become an issue that drives potential conflict or potentially drives conflict. And these things are interconnected, right? So yeah. the climate change, um, other pressures on freshwater and biodiversity connected yeah. with inequality. So that's, for me, one big set of of challenges that might not be too far away. And the other is... 
um, particularly in the so-called advanced Western democracies, and this might sound a little bit more esoteric, but our faith in democracy and our trust in politicians and politics and other institutions like unions and churches yeah. and business and the media is really low mm. because the current system is creating a society or an outcome a lot of people don't want. Mm. So th- for me, the second big burning issue is recalibrating that system of economics, government, media, political power. Yeah, And it's not throwing things away, it's recalibrating mm. and saying, great, that all worked really well for 100 years. Let's think about the next 100 years where we want to go. Let's make some tweaks. Yep. Do you think, though, on that point that, you know, you take the the whole controversy of, of Facebook as a as a group, you know, with all its, its various business of WhatsApp and Instagram and things around, that they have so quickly grown to having so much power that we either need to enforce them to break up or we need to regulate their power because it really has seemingly or ostensibly created some real challenges as a society and you know whether trump is the living embodiment of of the outcome of that or not i don't think it really matters but without doubt there seems to be these businesses that have way too quickly grown to have so much power over information and more importantly misinformation that somehow we need to rein those those kind of organizations in yeah, I think it's a, a challenge of of capitalism and innovation that which, which we've dealt with before, right? So railroads, there was a monopoly. It was an awesome bit of infrastructure. Mm-hmm. There were reasons why, like network effects and other reasons why it made sense for it to be a monopoly mm. or that once there's a whole lot of people using it, everyone else wants to use that one even though there might be another one equally as good. So we've had it with... Railroads, we've had it with telecommunications, we've had it with um, desktop computers. So, and they all get busted apart, right? Yeah. Because they create a utility that we love. Yeah. And we're very happy in the early days, I think, of, of um, particularly social media and, and big data, whether it's your, you know, your flybys card or whatever it is, where mm. we, we're trading away data almost unknowingly or unthinkingly for a benefit that we're getting and we're happy to do that. Yeah. But it's now getting to a point where there are breaches of privacy where people are waking up to just how big and and sort of dense that power mm. is. Um so I think it's another another case of a little bit of a pendulum swing. It's gone too far. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Doesn't mean you get rid of it all because there's great utility that's been created. Or do you break it up? Yeah, but you might break it up but yeah. still hang on to that utility. Yeah. One interesting thing that frustrates a lot of bureaucrats I work with is, you know, they, they're they sitting there saying if we only had access to all the data that people like a Facebook or a Quantium or a Woolworths, whatever, Shopper Card has, mm. we could deliver such better services to mm. citizens but citizens don't trust government to give them their data. Yeah. Whereas we're very happy to give our data to Qantas or Virgin or… Because we get a benefit from it. Exactly. Perceive benefit sometimes, but… Yeah, and we perceive yeah. we, we, up until now we've trusted them. Mm. So we we don't trust government and we don't believe government will do a good thing with our data. But if we could, in a sense, if we could fix that problem yeah, and fix the problem of the behemoths having all this data, our mm. private data, wouldn't that be a great result? It would be a great result. Who do people trust now? Like they don't trust governments, they don't trust the the big organisations. Uh, are they trusting the not for profits? Are they trusting the 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 smaller, more family owned organisations? Like it, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of trust anywhere anymore. Yeah, I think that's it. And and worse than that, there's a lot of distrust. Mm. So people, you know, lacking trust is one thing actively distrusting someone or some institution is also on the rise. Mm. It's Look, it's pervasive and I think it comes back to that issue I talked about before where a lot of people are working really hard, are contributing to society 
and feel like they're not getting much in return. So mm. they feel like society's not going in the right direction. That at the moment, forty percent of Australians um, feel like Australia is heading in the wrong direction, um, and an equal number think it's heading in the right direction. Yeah, but and twenty percent are undecided. Like, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, or are undecided. Yeah. Um, but that's a pretty bad number mm. <laughs> to um, have forty percent of your population feeling like you're heading in the wrong direction. But has that not been the case with democracy since the beginning of time, that most elections are pretty close and most people, if their government gets in, then they feel like they're going in the right direction. If their government doesn't get in, they're going in the wrong direction. And that just seems, to me, it seems that it's the way it is. You know, like when Obama was in power, like what did he get in by? Like 51% or something like that, that there was... 150 million people that didn't want him in power and, you know, Trump's maybe a little bit more people than that that don't want him in power. And so that doesn't seem like such shocking information to me. It just, it, it I'd be surprised if it wasn't more than that, that, you know, even if your government is in power and I think, again, using the US as a, as a case study, I think they're probably the the living embodiment of having someone in power that you voted in, but my God, I don't trust anything that he says or does anymore, you know, even if I am benefiting from it, you know, even if he, the stock market's at an all-time high, even if an employ, unemployment's at an all-time low, I still kind of, to your phrase before, feel like that this is a little bit of a Ponzi scheme and that we've borrowed money to give us tax cuts and ultimately we're going to have to pay them back. And so I just need to get as much as I can right now because this house of cards has got to come down at some stage. Yeah. The trust in institutions and politicians has been declining for the last 10 years in Australia. Mm. So it yeah, was since 2000 and since s- Kevin Rudd. Since Kevin Rudd. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I take your point on there's always going to be people who are not happy, but when we look at trust and that trend, it's gone down. It's gone down. I don't have the exact figures, but it's gone down markedly. Yeah. So there, there is a trend over, over time. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's, or well, as we were talking about before, I think there's a way that we can, we can look at, um, at food – and and environment and choosing a future and technology as kind of this example of where there is a complex challenge mm. in this context of no trust or low trust or high distrust. Yeah. So what can industry or what can players around that system do? Mm. You, 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 you can't rebuild trust by trying to rebuild trust. Yeah. You can only rebuild- Not through words. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to do something mm. which demonstrates one's credentials and then the effect of that is you've rebuilt trust. Yeah. So, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in, in, the, um, in the food and agriculture sector. Like what are the opportunities to- I've become the interviewer, sorry. But what yeah, are the opportunities? no, it's a, it's, a, it's a really, it's a great question and it's a, a great segue into, you know, one of the projects we've been working on for 18 months now with PwC around this blockchain-backed or blockchain-founded food trust platform, which literally will give back to the consumer not just the trust but the knowledge, the providence of the product from the brand that it is to where it was grown to what it was fed to its heart rate when it was killed to whether it ever broke cold chain to all sorts of – like really the the mind boggles when you, when you start to look at the – the opportunities that you can bake into this impenetrable, as we know it today, until someone, you know, comes up with a, a, a way of, of hacking it. So whether it is counterfeiting or whether it is just truly understanding the, the nutritional quality, and particularly when it comes to fresh produce, you know, because the – you know, first world governments have been very good with packaged foods of putting nutritional quality on there, but it's almost like that's an oxymoron because it's so processed that 
knowing the 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 macronutrients of it really isn't going to help you but we've never been able to do that with fresh produce and mm. and that is coming but the regulatory hurdles around that and the the economics around well who's going to pay for it how do you scale it if the end consumer truly wants that peace of mind and to trust the the person that they're buying it from through to the person that grows it then then someone's got to ultimately pay you know and that's been the big change that that we've seen in particularly with agriculture that if we go back to the 1950s and 60s the average and this is a european figure so but it applies largely and even though i don't have the exact facts with with australia that we used to spend 45 percent of our income on food that figure today is less than 15 percent you know that we continue to want to have premium quality food we just don't want to be paying for it you know whereas we'll pay ten dollars for a beer but i'm not going to pay 25 dollars for a steak at the pub you know i'll have 10 beers that cost me 100 bucks but that 25 dollars for a steak that i know the the providence of just seems a little bit rich so it's that big mind shift that you know, we, we will continue to have the conversation until it does change. And I don't think it changes with everyone. You know, back to using Patagonia as a as a classic example, that there are some people that go, I'm not paying outrageous Patagonia prices just because these people in, you know, Vietnam uh, are getting paid well and are working in a safe environment. I really don't care. I just want to go camping and I've got limited resources. But we are certainly seeing people at least starting to have those conversations around, I would pay more if I trusted that it actually was better quality because the food industry and the wine industry is another one as a whole has historically been mistrusted, you know, and we, we with this... Um, food trust platform pwc talk about this all the time that the average bottle of penfolds that is sold in china gets refilled eight times they drill a hole in the bottom and then they just put cheap shit in and they resell it as a bottle of grange you know and 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 similarly with branded product you know which the vast majority of australian produce these days is going to to asia and the middle east and there is an enormous challenge around counterfeiting and you know, um, the the cold chain and all those critical food security and, and, and food safety issues that go with it. But the technology is coming, Ralph. It's Well, it's not coming, it's here. It's mm. just how do we implement it and what's the business model around it. So it's super exciting. You know, our big challenge now is we have been talking about it for 15 months to, to customers and it will quickly get to the point of, eh, you talked about it, it hasn't happened, we'll just go back to the status quo. And, and that's the big risk that we see at the moment. Mm. You know, and then... Continuing with technology is the, you know, and we're starting to have some some really, you know, pointy conversations with some of these alternative protein um, companies, you know, the guys that are doing the, the plant-based stuff, Impossible Foods mm. and Beyond Meats. You know, Beyond Meats listed last week with a market cap of $3.7 billion, you know, that, that again feels a little bit, not a little bit, but way out of whack with what the the economics of the business model are. But certainly there is a lot of hysteria around at the moment and, and we see it as, as, as an important part of what we're doing, that if we can replace produce that we supply at the moment that's that's certainly factory farmed you know i think intensive farming given the population of the world is mm. it's just going to be here it's how do we do it in a way that doesn't destroy the the environment and the ecosystem but if we can replace a big chunk of factory farming with plant-based and cell-based meat then that's going to be a great outcome for people but again there are certainly on the cell-based stuff there's a there's a, a mile of moral and even environmental issues because if you're going to produce this protein in a, a facility, then, you know, you're going to have to have energy to, to power that facility and you're still going to have all of the, the residual stuff that go to this hysteria around the agricultural industry and so far as carbon footprint. Mm. It's not the farming so much as 
the tractors, the trucks, the planes, etc., that go to the carbon footprint of of bringing produce to to everyone to eat at their dinner table. You know, it's complex, but there's some really amazing stuff happening, and there's some really amazing people. You know, from the likes of Bill Gates down that are. Uh, you know, at, at least economically getting behind some some of these, you know, really great technologies. So what do you think, because um, I think technology, uh, it, in a sense, I mean, people think think of technology probably now as computers and that sort of stuff mm. um, and and even maybe science. But if you think of technology as, as a new thing that can solve a problem in a new way, let's say, um feels to me like on many, many issues facing Australia and the world, um, if we want to get it, if we want to get to a future which is a good future to live in, mm. and, and look, there'll be many versions of that depending on your politics, depending on where you are in the world, like what you think good is, but mm. there'll also be a lot of bad, yeah. right? So if we want to get to somewhere good, um, technology probably has to play a role in solving a lot of different things. Yeah. But we've got data that as many people in Australia are excited about technology as they are scared of technology. Yeah. So, again, in the, in the food one, it seems like we're, in a sense, someone's making a decision which is – we're going to use technology with this plant-based meats or whatever it's all called yeah. to solve this problem. Yeah. And I guess I'm wondering, has the public in a sense been brought along on that journey of, hey, guys, you know, steak's off or it's, it's this sort of luxury good now mm-hmm. and you're eating plant-based burgers? Yeah. There's um, – there. Uh, it's it's such a good question and I think the technology piece that certainly the general public aren't talking about at the moment but, you know, the the, the people that are deeply embedded in this are around some of the genetic stuff that's going on. You know, Ralph, you're here and you, your mum died of Alzheimer's and your dad had a heart attack when he was 65 and, you know, now there's a family history and that's as deep as it goes. You tick that when you go to see your GP. The the technology that's here and being developed really quickly is around you, you know, this whole N equals one approach to healthcare where we're all so uniquely different that very soon we'll be able to have data that says, you know what, being a vegetarian is probably the least healthy thing that you can do for yourself because of X, Y, and Z. And the understanding from a really young age around the way we learn, the way we digest food, the way we assimilate nutrients and all of those kinds of things is some of the stuff that I've been listening and reading to that I think fundamentally will move the needle. You know, like the supply side is one thing, but I think people better understanding outside of you know, Skippy and Bambi and all those beautiful little animals that we grew up watching as cartoons and wanting to love them, which I I deeply respect, but that if they want to look at themselves as being optimally healthy and what they can then do to contribute to the world and, and all those kinds of things, I see that as the biggest mover in from a technology perspective with with some of these big problems. You know, and similarly on the farm, mm. you know, that we, we, we had some guys on the show a couple of weeks back that are, are working on some, again, blockchain technology around optimal farming practices you know, so that you're not having to feed animals more than than what they require to get them to the optimal size, the optimal health and, and all those kinds of things. You know, even with what we're doing in our dry age room down here, the, the same blockchain technology that is food trust, and this is applies to, to medicine also, that, that they say you'd be able to tell when that piece of meat is at its optimal level, mm. you know, for digestibility, for bioavailability and all of those kinds 
kinds of things. And similarly, they're working on that with with medicine where they will tell you that a wound through technology is at a level where you can take the stitches out or you can take the bandage off or whatever it happens to be. And again, to reiterate, I think that's where the big movement over the next five to 10 years is going to come from, that we will intimately understand as human beings what's best for us. And as a byproduct of that, we'll be able to make informed decisions around what we consume. Yeah. So I think that would be, um, you know, if we could get to that point where there's the the data or the evidence or the information available where that's been collected and presented in a way that people are willing to trust it. Mm. And in some cases, that data requires tapping into people's information as well. So yeah. Also, share that they're yeah. trusting that to, to share it, and then we can have a. I keep coming back to it, but the the kind of the honest conversation about this is where we want to get to. This is where we are. Yeah. Here's all the data. Now what? Yeah. So it 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 opens up what you've just described in your uh, dry aging room. Mm. Um, if that could be replicated across a whole lot of different societal problems yeah. or opportunities how great would that be yeah but there are a few i think this i think this trust issue is just so massive and i think it's run away from us a bit over the last 10 years as a society yeah you know that you had the the the, the banking royal commission yeah. and people didn't you know powerful people didn't want that to happen and look what it uncovered yeah. you got the Royal Commission going on into aged care. People didn't want that to happen. It's yeah. going to uncover some bad stuff. You had the Royal Commission into the sexual abuse of kids in institutions, yeah. particularly religious institutions. So I'm saying that because what you've just said, I'm I'm really optimistic about, but it's brought to my mind just how important trust really is. Trust based on data. I think the, you, you, you're really hitting the nail on the head there, Ralph. Like you take the argument of eating meat is bad for the environment as an example um, and you take someone like Leonardo DiCaprio that's a, 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 a spokesperson for climate change and I don't know, maybe he's a vegan, maybe he's not, but let's assume he is. I'm a vegan because I care about climate change but then flies around the world in his private jet. You know, it's being able to literally sit there and have a calculator and go, well, that's all well and good, but here's the here's the actual data on all the choices you're making, what clothes you're wearing, what transport you're taking, um, what you're eating, all those kinds of things. Because I think it's so easy, back to your social media point before, where you get some of these influencers and, and high-profile people that, that decide certain things are good and bad, and all of a sudden there's hysteria, but it doesn't actually help anything. But I think this is an interesting point because I think those influencers – are really important. So, absolutely, for, for I of, agree with that. For a yep. lot of people, they don't have the time, the interest, the that they feel like they don't have the level of expertise to understand all that data and its implications. Yeah. So they want, and I think we all want <laughs> someone to explain things for us, or we want someone who we trust to tell us. This is, you know, this is a good path through this complexity or through this issue. Should yeah. I eat meat? Shouldn't I eat meat? Well, I trust DiCaprio. He's telling me not to eat meat because it's bad for the environment. I don't think uh, he says that. I, I imagine he does eat. I was just, but yeah, yeah I, but I know what you're did, saying. Right? If he did, yeah. So those influences are a really important part of the infrastructure, if you will, because they're they're looking at the data, they're looking at all the complexity, and they're saying, yeah. Okay, based on all of that, this is what we should do. The problem is that we don't trust experts anymore. Yeah. Uh, the We don't trust the churches. We don't trust politicians. We don't trust government officials. We don't trust business people. Yeah. So, and that opens up, I think, a gap in the market, which is where social media influencers come in. Mm. And then you can have a whole conversation swayed by 
you know, almost pseudoscience or fads or whipping up hysteria yeah. rather than, okay, I used to trust the Department of Health or yeah, my World Health local MP or, yeah. or, you know, or my doctor or whatever. Now I trust Kylie Jenner. Yeah, or whoever. Yeah. And where, where does that leave us? Yeah, and it's, it's a really valid point and you look at some of the, you know, back to the the – agricultural industry some of the documentaries that have been very emotive in the last couple of years the what the health is a classic example where it's been debunked by some of the best scientists on the planet but not a week goes by where i don't have a friend or a friend of a friend that tells me they're a vegetarian for life because they watched this piece of what at the end of the day was animal welfare propaganda dressed up in a, a health documentary guise. And I think, you know, again, well-intentioned people that have values, but it's it's cherry-picking information and research. And I think this is the biggest challenge that most people face is that I can find virtually for every argument a piece of research, not necessarily the the best research in the world, but some of the best, you know, best research institutions on the planet, the cherry pick data, and that will support your argument or support my argument, which is directly opposed to yours. And I think that confuses the shit out of everybody. And some people just throw up their hands and go, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just going to live. I'm just going to live and eat KFC, you yeah. know, and drink beer and not exercise and all of those kinds of things. And I think that would be a, a, a sad outcome and 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 i absolutely agree with you on that i think not only people trusting because that 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 has to be earned but people being trustworthy again is so critically important and we need to get that get get to that really quickly yeah i think people also take um you know that the, the they'll be really interested and have been passionate about something for years and years and years and then a new thing comes along and they leap on that as evidence or a reason to do what they were doing for mm. a long time. So I'll give you an example with climate change. Um, obviously a lot of people, um, and I'm one of them, care about um, about forests. And, yeah. you know, we, we don't have so much forest left in Australia or the world. So I feel like we should protect that forest because it provides all sorts of different good things mm -hmm. and can actually be managed sustainably even, um, you know, taking some economic benefit out of them. But so there's a bunch of people who are passionate about forests. Then climate change becomes an issue and a third of greenhouse gas around the world comes from land use, as mm -hmm. you'd know, from deforestation, from agricultural practices yeah. mainly. So... Then, but two thirds comes from other things, right? Then these people who care about forests jump on and say, right. So, therefore, we have to do everything we can to not only stop deforestation, but also um, to, well, to, to stop deforestation, right? Whereas the, the, there's another element here, which is, well, we could regrow lands that were forests back into forests yep. and that would solve the problem and we could maybe keep deforesting a little bit here where it's going to turn into high potential agriculture with good nutritional values mm -hmm. and regrow a whole lot of forest over here that is going to end up with the same biodiversity and the same carbon storage, right? Yeah. But because people are so focused on no more chopping down trees – they use the next thing being climate change as more reason to stop people chopping down trees yeah. rather than focusing on what's now the bigger picture, mm. which is climate change. Yeah. So within the bigger picture of climate change, maybe we need to make some trade-offs. And I'm sure that's the same in the issues that you talk about a lot as well with meat, with environment, with obesity, with poor nutrition, yeah. these sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. The, I, I think I think trading it off is is the only way and and being honest and holistic with yourself around if you really care about climate change then and also want to be 
have children and all those things, which typically a lot of these people do, then you just need to be a little bit more pragmatic around it and and understand that someone gave me the the great analogy of giving up your car. Mm. You know, the person that drives an average of 10,000 kilometres a year, the carbon impact of that is you have to drive 8,000 kilometres, so 80% of the year, to have the same effect of one flight from here to Perth. You know, so if you're going to give up your car but keep flying to LA three times a year, then you're probably better off keeping your car and just flying to LA once or twice a year. And again, back to my point before, I think we will get to that point reasonably quickly where you'll be able to have an app on your phone that tells you, you know, in in real hard facts what the the ecological impacts mm. of your decisions are. And I think I think I that's a healthy though, thing. I I agree. But I'm interested in the behavioural reality of whether enough people respond to that sort of information to then change their behaviour. Yeah. Like my sense is not data and because we've had smart meters, we've had all sorts of the, the, for a long time. Often, time, often yeah. the data is there, and it, it's not the thing that drives the drives the response. We did we did deep research a few years ago looking at some of this stuff around attitudes and it, people believe that people believe no one person can make a difference yeah. in Australia. So I think part of it, and you, you sort of touched on it before, of, well, nah, I don't know who to trust. I'm just going to go on my merry way. So sort of like if you're in, if, if, we're, if you're in a, a confusing situation and you believe your own actions aren't going to make any difference, Mm. then you just keep on with your own behaviour, right? Yeah. So, yes, I would say data is important, but there's something much deeper. You know, we run a leadership program for politicians to um, basically the only tailored professional development that politicians get um, in Australia. And we spend a lot of time in that getting them back to their values. Yeah. Why did you get into politics? What sort of person do you want to be? What do you, what's your legacy you want to leave behind? Mm. And I don't know if you've looked at sort of the, the psychological models around the iceberg or going deeper into the, you know, into the, the personality and you can do this with, with a system, whether it's the meat system or other systems, but – as we're sitting on top of the water is that one eighth or yeah. whatever it is of the iceberg, yeah. which is the symptoms or what everyone sees. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, that's the data that you're talking about, right? And and the symptoms of someone's eating a hamburger, which is not highly nutritional versus and then they're getting obesity or whatever. So there's the stuff we see and that's obviously the easiest to engage with because it's visible to us. Yeah. But the stuff that's driving behaviour, whether it's in a system or um, in, a, in an individual, is deep-seated things around their mental models, how they see the world, do they see themselves as powerful or powerless in the world, Do they? Um, what's of value to them, is value belonging, so I want to do the same thing that people around me do are doing Mm. or is there deep-seated value around health and well-being so they're going to do something different from all the people around them even though it might mean that they don't belong so getting getting down into that deeper level of what are the emotional drivers of behavior is so important so important yeah perfect way to finish my friend yes well awesome thanks for coming on yeah thank you cheers man cheers